Sure, we'll just get through. Wonderful. Well, welcome to you to yet another Black History Conversations on Zoom. Uh, a bit of a special day today, the 11th of November. Um, and we've got uh, some really interesting things to reflect on today. Um, we've been um, exploring how the stories of Black history are being told. Um, and today we're going, we are welcoming Professor Robert Burroughs to tell us about the research he's been doing in his new book, Black Students in Imperial Britain. Well, I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International um, and uh, Simon Fringo from Belong Nottingham is with us as well. Um, we've also uh, been joined by Beverly Provat Goldstein and she's going to introduce the African Lives in Northern England calendar for this year, which is good. We've also got colleagues from Windrush Allies Network and we need to remember that Black History Unlocked, our uh, website is going to be available um, when we get around to getting it sorted out. Okay then, so we will go today. Now I'm in Australia, um, so I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living. That's the Wunjiri people of the Kulin Nation. I respect their elders, past, present and future. This land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nations and was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Also recognising that it's the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. And I thought that was particularly relevant um, today because uh, we're going to be talking so much about um, black students in Imperial Britain. But I just want to say that um, prior to this meeting, um, I was able to join um, Chris's memorial service um, some of you will remember Chris, in the early days of Black History Conversations, he never ever missed one. Um, and it was really sad to um, hear early last month that Chris had passed. So his memorial service today was wonderfully attended um, and, uh, and even had Alicia Scott singing Amazing Grace. So that was, that was pretty special. So respect to Chris and love to all his family. Right, now we have with us Professor Robert Burroughs from the School of Cultural Studies and Humanities. You're still at the same place, are you, um, uh, Robert? Correct, I am. Good, good. Well, I, I understand because I looked it up that you're a cultural historian and literary critic working on the 19th century specialising in areas of empire, humanitarianism, slavery and race. Published a wide range of research on travel and tourism, particularly in marine environments. And uh, interesting, I suppose, this is what triggered the, um, the book that we're going to be talking about today, Robert. Um, you're a Lever Human Trust Research Fellow um, and the research for African students in Victorian Britain. So this is how the book is going to look when I gather it's going to be published um, as an actual hard, hard copy or paperback copy, I don't know. That's going to be, I gather, in January, but you'll tell us a little more about that. But this book is available free to read at, and there's this great big long link there. So um, in a little while, I'll put that link in the chat and then people will be able to, to, to look at that and I'll say it's really well presented if I can say as a an online book um Robert I was really pleased with that so the got a little bit of information here in case you want to refer back to anything Robert so you had, um, you've got various um articles in different figures and uh, this is the, uh, the 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 areas that you cover um, because there were two parts of the life, weren't there, of the uh, African Institute, uh, the Congo Institute first, and became the African Institute. So that uh, I thought was perhaps useful to include. I'm sure if you're allowed to do this, but it seems informative. And then there are various different illustrations, some of which some of us have seen before and others perhaps not. Um, oh, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you, Robert, because at the beginning of your book, you thank an awful lot of people, and I haven't included that clip, but 
Further along, it says that over the years, a community of researchers have carefully preserved and promoted the story at the heart of this book, which is the story of the of, uh, Reverend William Hughes. And you say that we've lived, I, I, I'm one of these people that have lived with this history in ways that you, Robert, never will. And many of these individuals warmly encouraged and enlightened me. And I do hope all of them see my efforts as complementary to theirs, even when my opposition differs to theirs. And I think that's fine. It, it's really, um, really um, great that you, you see that because it is a difficult story and it has been quite a hard story for those of us who've uh, have lived with this history in, in different ways and uh, I mean I'm only a small part of it but a special thanks are owed to Norbert uh, for sharing his deep knowledge of this story he's absolutely wonderful me for connecting to local groups that have done so much to preserve and promote this history and it, honestly it's been such a fascinating journey tell you a bit more about that at some stage but um and then Jean Williams Gwyneth Higginson um, and Richard Higginson um, for taking me closer to the world of Congo House. And maybe you'll you'll talk, um, we'll ask you some questions and we'll, we'll go through the uh, little bit about the autograph book as well, because that was a fascinating find. And Jean Williams is, um, Reverend William Hughes's uh, grand, granddaughter, I think, great granddaughter. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, thank you for including that. I was really, really touched. Um, and I shall come back to that quote a little bit later on. Well, lovely to see you, Beverly, that you've joined us. That's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And other, we've got other colleagues here. So Beverly, just, um, I'm going to mute you, okay? Just while we're, we're talking to, to Richard and I'm going to Mute you, Annette, as well, so we don't get any interference on this. And uh, we want to um, uh, again welcome you, Robert, uh, but also um, to say that we're going to do this as a, a sort of questions and answers. <laughs> and hopefully, I'm going to have the questions and you're going to have the answers. <laughs> so I don't know. I haven't got a list, so you can prompt me at any stage. <laughs> okay, then. So, um, all right. So, uh, have we got this sorted so that it could look in an interview format, Simon? Um, I don't know. It depends what the way your screen looks, doesn't it? Not the way my screen looks, but that's fine. Right, okay then. So, um, Robert, the book is called Black Students is Imperial in Imperial Britain, with a particular focus on the African Institute. So, the the times that um, that you've you're looking at 1889 to 1911 so tell us how did you first get into wanting to research this area of black history yeah okay thanks liz and thanks again for inviting me along to stand thank you so much everyone for coming along to listen to this and let me just say i'm really looking forward to hearing um what beverly's going to say later about the the calendar which i think sounds really more interesting than what i've got to say but anyway i'll hold off that and look forward to hear that bit of this uh talk so i get to this history um feels to me like everybody that i've spoken to um who knew this story has got their own weird little personal connections to this history very often you have i know and norbert's got some really interesting stories about you know when he first traveled to wales and then on to colwyn bay and how he discovered this school i don't have any of those personal connections myself i'm a, I'm a researcher and i'm, a, I'm an academic but I do get to this history in a kind of roundabout way, um, because although it's black British history, I get to it via the Congo, actually. Um, my earlier research is about the Congo and in particular, the Congo Free State, um, the colony uh, plundered by King Leopold II. Um, and, it, and it's in the same time period, of course, that this book takes place, that all of that stuff is happening. So my, the book that I wrote before this one, it's about the Congo Free State and it's about the, um, in contrast to all of the other books about that history, which focus on the actions of uh, white colonialists, either, you know, the sort of villainous, violent individuals who preyed on uh, African resources and African bodies in that time, or about the sort of more supposedly heroic figures, the, the, the humanitarians and missionaries who intervened in that history. And, and brought about some change. 
I focused on the Africans themselves and looked at the ways in which um, peoples of the Upper Congo did what they could to, in you know, in 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 circumstances of great oppression, did what they could to bring about change themselves through resisting colonial colonialism. And the way, the thing that I focused on in particular was the ways in which they reported um, the violence that was happening to them to, through whatever channels were available and the great and often very brave journeys and acts of um, witnessing um, that that entailed on people of the Congo. And one of the things I learned in that, re in researching that book was that um, there were many black missionaries in the Congo, unsurprisingly, some of them um, from the Caribbean, some of them uh, who were Africans who'd been trained in Britain, possibly or elsewhere in Europe before making their way back over to Central Africa. And one or two of the figures that I came across um, while researching that history, because these, these black missionaries were important figures uh, as sort of intermediary figures, helping so often the Congolese to get some respite from colonialism and helping them to report their stories. One or two of the names I came across were people who had um, spent time in Colwyn Bay at this school. And so when I was researching that book, I, didn't, I knew nothing about the school. It's one of those things where you kind of think, hmm, that's interesting. Let's know a bit more about that. And then, you know, however many years later it is, however many hours researching it, and you've, you've ended up writing a book about it. And I explored the lives of, you know, it's Frank Taver Clark in particular was a student in Colwyn Bay who would go on to have a very long career in the Congo as a missionary um, and would make important witnessing statements on behalf of um, the people to whom he preached about the violence they were suffering. There are a few more people as well. So that basically, so it's this strange, long-winded route via the Congo to Wales in sort of historical research terms that led me to this story. And then when I'd kind of found it and read a few bits about it, I thought, you know, that this has to be a book that I don't think the last word has been said yet. And I don't think I've said the last word on it either, but I think we need to know a bit more about it. So that, that was why I did this. That's absolutely fascinating. And the early research that we did, because this story in terms of black history in Wales is a very important story. Mm -hmm. It's the story of the Reverend William Hughes, who um, trained as a missionary and went out to Africa and then came back to Colwyn Bay. And he came back with a rather different idea. And the idea was that he would um, establish an institute where African students could come and study in Colwyn Bay in North Wales. So for those of you who haven't heard anything about this story before, it's a really fascinating story. So some of us undertook some community research as our black history activities, and we actually set up a book club and I'm thinking book club when I think about your book, Robert, as well, because the book Scandal at Congo House, which was um, published a few years ago, with its very difficult title, which upset um, his uh, Reverend William Hughes's uh, descendants very much indeed. So we decided that we would try and help them by uh, researching the story from their point of view and telling the story as they did. And a few some in the early sessions of Black History Conversations, we actually showed the film and that's available and tells the story of the African Institute, but very much from the point of view of, of um, the relatives telling the story of the Reverend William Hughes and the good works he did. To me, there was always this part of the story that was never that, that, that there's not enough known about and that's the story of the students and the students are actually really uh, really the, the the most interesting focus so to find that you were writing a book about the students and thank you very much because this is the second time you've joined us to tell us about what you were doing and we promised that we'd invite you back when we knew that the book was uh, either available or about to be. So uh, it's really, really good to, to have you with us. So I was um, 
intrigued in the way that you introduce the book. I confess that I haven't read it all the way through to the end because it's got quite a lot of information in it. Um, but you start off reflecting, and I think that was the, the slide that I was just going to show just now. You said that um, you, after the introduction, you say, what, what follows hopefully demonstrates that pursuing black history is not to engage in a zero sum game in which teachers choose between black and white. Many chapters of Britain's history demonstrate the overlap and cross fertilization of cultures and identities, ostensibly separated by race and ethnicity, as well as at times um, at which those overt differences cause division, disharmony, and violence. And to deny these connections is to deny parts of ourselves, whichever racial or ethnic identities we see ourselves in terms of. The point is well communicated by exploring how audiences in Britain reacted to the student body of the African Institute. So I think that that paragraph, to me, summed up a lot of things. One is that it's beautifully readable the the introduction um part is is which I, i've got through is really easy to read and it places this story that you're going to tell us in where we're at today in the black lives matter um focus of understanding black history better and i thought that that's really, really interesting. I hadn't come across that in any any other books that I, I've read. Not that I'm a, a great academic having uh, accessed information from all sorts of sources, but um, yes, it was really interesting. And, and you discuss, um, you know, how, how this is an example which shows, um, shows something different, something very, very different was happening in Colwyn Bay at the time of the Congo House and the African Institute. So I think perhaps the next thing is, um, if you wanted to, to talk to us any more about how you see this story in the context of where we're at with exploring black history today. Yeah, thanks. Okay, that's a, that's a huge question. Thanks for um, introducing it in that way. Um, the book starts in a very sort of, um, I hope, a very sort of reflexive mm. tone, and I talk about me and where I fit into this research, which is a slightly, I don't know, it's a, it's a questionable way to start a book, which is called Black Students in Imperial Britain, because I half suspect readers want to just get on with hearing about that, but I felt it important to acknowledge uh, where I, how I'm inserting myself into this story, and um, that... And, and to be, be really upfront about some of the ways in which um, I'm a kind of beneficiary from, from this research and that this isn't necessarily just a simple, I don't know, that my, my intervention is itself sort of complicated. So I start in that area. Then I move on to talk about um, debates around the curriculum today. Um, and I think that's where the book has its, obviously its most sort of contemporary relevance because um you know it's a book about education in the end it's a history of education um so where are we at today well those comments which you were just quoting on that on that image just there is about the way some of the ways in which black history is kind of debated and contested in britain today and it's obviously kind of linked into um so-called culture wars and there is that kind of quite right-wing reactionary view of black history that um, that somehow should the curriculum be expanded, then it will will be at the expense of other history or real history or white history or whatever that is. So I was just trying to sort of, um, I, I guess I was putting forward this school as an example of the ways in which um, simply to focus on the experiences of black people in Britain is not to lose um, sight of wider social questions or issues. They're all part and parcel of the same thing. And that becomes really clear when you look at this school, which is obviously it's sort of um, only populated by uh, black students, about almost 90, we think, almost 90 individuals passed through in the 20 years um, that it was open for business. But it's actually also a story about, about Wales and about North Wales and about 
how it views its own culture and its own identities. Um, it's a story about the Welsh education system at times. And it's a story about how Colwyn Bay was shaping up to and understanding itself in relation to this much wider thing that's happening beyond the school, which is empire itself. So a really, it's a micro history, really, 90 people. It's, a, it's almost a group biography of 90 individuals. So it's a tiny subject to write a book about in one way. But I hope that there's a way of kind of framing that little story in a way that makes it much more widely relevant um, to us all, but also to sort of how Victorian society was reflecting on bigger questions about its identity, its empire, all of those kind of things. It's just brilliant to, to put that into context. Thank you. And we've just been joined by Christine White. Christine, welcome. Um, I know <laughs> I know your, some of your study area is is this interest in um, Africans who came to study in, in Britain. So um, we're going to be perhaps hearing more about your work on another occasion, but it's really great that you've been able to join us today. Now, Robert very kindly said that we could ask questions about um, uh, about the book and um, and you may well want to chip in, Christine. I don't know if you've read it through, maybe you're, you're proofing it through, but if you've got questions that you think would help, help others understand about the book, that would be great. And anybody else, if you want to ask a question, if you can manage to put your hand up, then uh, we'll, we'll include you. Um, so the next thing, Robert, is the, then looking at the actual stories. I wondered if you wanted to choose maybe one or two of the students and just tell them, give us a brief outline of their stories so that uh, folks who don't know this, this history can get a bit of an insight about how they came to be in Wales. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, well, a couple of times, Liz, you said that this was a sort of new thing that was happening in, in Wales in this time, and that's true in many ways. You know, this is a quite unique little story in some ways. In other ways, it fits into wider patterns um, and wider stories about um, African people's migration to Britain in the 19th century. Uh, Christine knows a lot about that. But and so the early part of the story, I think in particular, where we have, as you said, this former missionary quickly retired, William Hughes, uh, leaving the Congo, but bringing home with him two young boys, you know, um, around about 10 years old each, slightly less than that, I think. Um, sort of working out the permission to do that rather in retrospect once back in Britain as far as you know the missionary bodies were confirmed work were concerned and then um, raising them up in Wales with the idea eventually of them returning home as missionaries and that would be the story pretty much that's the pattern for the first or sort of 10 15 individuals who come they're from Central Africa they're very young they're intended to go back to Congo um sounds extraordinary and it is in many ways but it's also a part of a bigger picture where you do have missionaries um taking young children um to britain for periods of um education um they would often be involved um in the translation of publications that missionaries were working on um they would be involved, some work sometimes as servants, and sometimes they would just kind of be paraded around a bit um, as a sort of fundraising effort to raise money for missionary bodies. And I, I suspect that Hughes's plans might well have been at some point that he would do what so many other missionaries were doing, which was to take these boys, um, Kinkasa and Kanza, back to. Um, Britain with him to raise money on behalf of the Baptist Missionary Society. But when it becomes clear to him that he's not going to stay on in the Congo as a missionary, he has this other idea, which is to, um, to sort of go the other way, if you like, um, flip around the missionary movement by bringing Africans to Britain. Um, and he uses the boys 
um, in all kinds of performances on stage. They're sometimes singing, they sometimes dress up, um, sometimes giving speeches, but what they're doing is raising money. And at first the money is going off to other missionary organizations, but then Hughes founds his own school and, and, and those first boys and the subsequent generations of children coming over to Britain are involved in the work of um, raising money for the Congo Institute. Um, it's a small enterprise. It isn't hasn't got big backers behind it. Hughes himself was not a wealthy man by any by any means. It depends upon donations and often quite small scale mass donations of money, and that means Hughes has to get out there with his young charges, uh, touring first of all around Wales. Um, and, and, and kind of making his way through whip rounds in churches and in lecture theatres. And that's a huge part of the early arrivals experiences in Britain, being part of that. And it takes some time before they settle down into a more sort of routinized, regular experience, living in Colwyn Bay and going to school and so on. But eventually enough um, money is raised that um, more and more people can come. Um, and at that point, something quite dramatic happens as far as Hughes is concerned, which is he, he loses the ability to recruit people from the Congo. Um, there's a sort of ban put basically on migration away from Central Africa. It's a little hint that things are really not going well there. And it's quite a dark chapter unfolding there. So Hughes has to look out a bit wider, further afield, and he looks to the colonies in the, some of the British colonies in Western Africa, as well as the independent Republic of Liberia. Makes all, he goes on a tour, another tour of Africa, makes connections. And um, then you start to have a slightly older group of boys and a few girls too coming over um, for their education. And the main period of the African Institute as it then becomes known rather than the Congo Institute is this spell of various West African um, towns arranging for sort of their brightest and best to come over. They still intended to go as missionaries or to go back as missionaries and so on. And that does happen in many cases, but a few things happen when the story changes that way. One is that the sort of bourgeois in Africa get interested in the scheme even more so. The sort of, um, you know, the middle class Africans sort of think, OK, well, maybe we should help raise money for this as well. And then we can send maybe our own children, you know, literally our own children or other fr fr friends, children over. Um, so there's sort of West African patronage happening to the scheme. And that's one of the really interesting bits of the history, I think, is that you've got West Africans organising to raise money for a charity in Britain. I think that, that counters some of the assumptions we might make about who has the agency when it comes to charity in, in that period in particular. Um, and the other thing that happens is that um, those people who are coming over are themselves already possibly quite well educated. They're from pretty much middle class backgrounds and they have quite high expectations about what they might achieve in their lives. So suddenly the idea that they're going to go back and just become missionaries and, you know, make it live through a sort of meager existence it doesn't quite tally with who these people really are anymore so they want to come over and they want to come to Colwyn Bay but it's a stepping stone now for other career opportunities and many of them will go on to study medicine first and foremost um, some will go on to study law some English uh, universities around Britain so what's happening then in that sort of later gener later generations is that um, the school becomes yeah, like I say, a stepping stone, a place in where uh, leading on to um, uh, a spawning ground for black intellectuals in Britain. And so the school at that point becomes part of the sort of early sort of pan-Africanist or Ethiopianist sort of networks which are emerging in Britain in around the Edwardian period. Um, some of them uh, train in university for a few years, and then go back and they might become missionaries or they might become sort of medical missionaries so that they're making their way through medical practice while also preaching. Um, but many of them, of course, don't follow that pathway at all. And the book ends by looking at some quite unusual and different trajectories 
um, experienced by the students um, after their time in Colwyn Bay. So I, fi I finished the book by looking at um, one woman, Lulu Coote, who went on to work as a nurse in Britain for pretty much um, all of her adult life. Um, I think she dies in the mid 60s. Um, her life is still being researched by some other community researchers right now, which is really good. I look at a, a, a man called um, Andrew Nazaire, who um, spent time working as an X-ray photographer in Liverpool in the early 1900s, but then gets involved in sort of dock work and gets sort of his life gets sort of for a moment wrapped up in the race riots of the late 1910s in Liverpool. And I finished the book by looking at a jazz musician who um, trained at the school, had a bit of time in the university, then becomes a jazz musician, just as an instance of the various and different ways, you know, black lives panned out in this period. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And it, it it's already beginning to expand the understanding of uh, uh, of the students who attended the African Institute. I think it's really, really exciting. And as you say, you know, there's lots more, more to do. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask, ask one more particular thing that I, I'm, I have an interest in. And, um, and then maybe Christine, if there's something that you want to, to reflect on too, and if there's any other questions or points, and then we'll think about how we're going to manage to read this wonderful book, because it's, it really brings so much life into understanding this particular period of history from 1889 to 1911, not just in the UK, but in Africa and other parts of the world as well. And so if you've all got your personal timelines, you know, you need to fit, fit in just what this, this particular time is about. But the question I wanted to ask you was about the autograph book. Now, the autograph book, first, um, the first contact I had from Gwyneth um, was um, way back. Um, she'd heard that we were interested in the research and she, uh, managed through the newspaper to make contact with us after we published an article and she said I've got this autograph book she said and it's um, it relates to the story and I, I remember driving to Cheshire to see this autograph book and just carefully sitting there and just photographing the whole book I don't know what's happened to all our photographs of it but we did that at that time so you obviously contacted Gwyneth and and what was your feelings about the autograph book and tell us who you think it was who wrote it whose book it was yeah okay thanks so just before I get there and talk about the autograph book you've mentioned a few times about reading this and you know it's an academic oh, book yeah. and so on and oh, you know that's sort a real of copy there, it is. there it is yeah just right. um how to go about reading an academic book I mean I'm really glad that it's free to read I just want to say that because I, it makes me feel much less guilty about the prospect of anybody buying it because it is an academic book it's quite chunk you know chunky and a weighty book I think you know you saying earlier you haven't read it all uh, hands up I, I don't think I've, I, I, of course, I've sometimes read academic books from cover to cover, but I don't think they're always meant to be read that way. So it is kind of for dipping into, I think, and having a look at the index and thinking about which bits are interesting to you and dropping in and out. And that makes it really good, actually, the fact that it's online. You can easily even then sort of search around in the book as well, I think. So it's not necessarily one to be read from cover to cover. I think that's just how academic books are. As for this autograph book, it's a fascinating little document. Um, I, uh, sort of, it's kept from about, I think, um, the early 1900s to about 1905. It's by one of, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's one of William Hughes's daughters who kept it. Um, one of his daughters was very sick and as a young child, she'd been run over by a, uh, a cart and spent most of her, well, her, her short life um, really feeling the effects of that. Um, and so I think it's certainly her book. And what it contains is several autographs, not just by the students. There are some other sort of visitors to the to the house as well, um, friends and family. And that's interesting in itself because undispersed among those autographs are these wonderful autographs by a, a, a clutch of the, of the students. Um, 
from all over the world, you know, because I should have said before, it's not just West Africa and Southern uh, Central Africa in the end that the students are coming from. They're even coming from the USA. There are one or two from the Caribbean, uh, from Southern Africa too. And the, the autograph book reflects all of that. Um, the And when, when we say autograph books, you know, it's not just sort of a, an autograph that you might collect off a celebrity nowadays where they just simply scrawl their name and that's it. Um, these are quite substantial little pieces of writing. Um, they might be a page long. They might be, they're very often quotations from sort of famous authors. So Shakespeare looms very large. The students are clearly really into Shakespeare and can quote him at length. The Bible too is the other the thing that they can clearly just quote, you know, chapter and verse on recall. Um, but but Tennyson is there too. There are some other sort of you know famous writers from the period that they summon up, and then brilliantly as well, there are some original writings too. So they try their hand at poetry in some cases, or they'll or else they'll come up with their own sort of little pithy um, statements, which are sort of typical of the period in terms of what autographs look like. It's a fascinating little thing, and why it's valuable because you know an autograph book traditionally speaking, would not be regarded by a historian as a valuable thing, right? It would be traditionally seen as being ephemeral and sort of throwaway and, you know, um, maybe part of sort of family history, but not serious history. But what makes it, I think, really valuable is that it is, it remains very rare to come across private writings, archive writings by Black people from this period in Britain. Um, black people are being published in this period, of course, but um, rarely have their private thoughts been kept on record. You could argue, you can think about whether an autograph is really a private thought at all, because it's being addressed to somebody very much with a sense of it actually being kind of written for the world's consumption in the end. But there's a sort of form of intimacy here going on and a form of community building through writing. And it's not just that student community, but actually a wider community of patrons, family members, friends, and so on, um, into which these little um, autographs fit. So it's, it's fascinating. I mentioned it a couple of times in the book, and I mention it partly as, in, as a way of acknowledging some of the limits of my own study, which is that the archive actually went for this school is quite limited. Um, there, there, weren't, there were none, I didn't make very many of those hallelujah discoveries where I suddenly come across some private diary kept by one of the students or anything like that it's just not there as far as I'm aware hope I'm proven wrong one day um so the the autograph book reminded me of the limits of my own research um I'm also writing something I'm writing a little article about it where I can explore it in more depth as a sort of follow-up to the book so I'm gonna I'm, I'm writing something which puts it in the context in the history of autograph writing in the 19th century um, hopefully that will come out free and open as well to read. Well, that's wonderful because there's so much potential and having had, you know, now with your book adding to the wealth of information, it's really going to help in Wales as the, the new curriculum, which includes Black History, is going to come out because this is a, one of the classic um, stories in Wales. Um, absolutely fascinating and and lovely that you you did take advantage of of seeing the uh, the autograph book and I think David Davidson Javavu is one of the um, students who wrote in the book and his his claim to fame mm. we discovered was that he uh, went back to Africa and established F Fort Hare University. Is it Fort Hare? He's the first. Um, he's the first black faculty member at Fort Hare, mm. um, and one of his his real claim to fame is that one of his um, later students will be um, Nelson Mandela, which is a wonderful little link to this sort of quite obscure history to major, you know, currents of history. Lovely. Um, he writes a little. He's one of the ones who writes an original little uh, poem in the autograph book. Yeah. So yeah. it's quite a nice find. Yeah. Absolutely fabulous. So that that's really um, really exciting, and and also to see how uh, how this sort of fits together with 
many other histories. And Norbert, our colleague Norbert, who I mentioned earlier, um, who is Congolese, um, ha has done a lot of research, but also linking Colwyn Bay with um, with the Congo. And I was I was able to help to facilitate a day when. Um, people from the Congolese embassy, two coach loads of people came up from London. They brought a band with them and we re-consecrated the graves of the students who sadly died in Colwyn Bay. Um, but their graves were beautifully uh, restored and uh, and we had a fabulous day and they, they even brought their own chef and cooking. It was really great. So it's become a real community um, enterprise uh, and the, the local historical societies looked at it and as I say we had a book club um, to um, get through Scandal at Congo House the book that was published previously on this uh, story so it would I think be really useful and I haven't had a chance yet to talk to the librarians or um, the cohort who were in that first, I don't know, Simon remembers some of them, he came to Colwyn Bay, it's a bit of a centre for our black history activities, uh, we used to meet in the uh, the civic centre. So um, yeah, so it would be great, I think, maybe to have even an online book club that we could we could go through it because there's so much to talk about. You know, I could, I could have picked out any paragraph and chosen it and, and really developed the conversation through. So I, I'm thrilled to bits and delighted. And also we had on one of our previous sessions, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, an author from Lagos, and he's now published his book about a well-known um person who in really introduced Christianity into Lagos. I think that's my understanding of the story. Do you remember which student that was? Um, so that book is um, about Majola Agbebi, who yeah. was not so much a student at the school, but one of the yeah. but one of the really important black visitors. I said earlier, um, one of the in that sort of latter phase of the history of the school. Um, it, it, it's attracting all kinds of interest in West Africa and West African intellectuals that get involved in the school, give money to it. And then some of them come over and, um, and visit too. And Agbebi is probably the most important example of that. So he, he spent a full six months uh, in Britain with Colwyn Bay being his base. Uh, Agbebi is a fascinating character. It, it wouldn't be right to say he introduced Christianity to, uh, to Lagos, but what he does certainly is, um, rethink what Christianity might mean for Lagos and for West Africa more generally. And he, he really makes a big push, an Ethiopianist argument around, well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, um, if we're gonna um, practice this, this religion, let's think about why it matters to us. And he wants to kind of uh, Africanize Christianity and remember its African roots and, and that kind of stuff. So quite a radical thinker in that context and a really interesting um, figure and the 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 gentleman who joined this session previously is Ayadeji Abunde, who's just written a new book, the book about Mojola Egbebi. So yeah. that's just and that's just come out um, earlier this year. Yes, we were, we we're going to invite him to come back and talk with us again. He was really interesting to to share that story. Yeah. Oh, brilliant! That's so good. <laughs> Okay, well, I can't see any other hands up, but I would like to ask Christine just to uh, maybe sort of wrap this part of the session up. Um, and we'll thank you so much, Rob. And then Beverly's going to tell us about the calendar. Yeah, hi, Liz, and hi, Rob. I'm sorry for coming in late, and I have to I have to leave it too because I've got a, a student meeting. But I, I think, um, yeah, the book sort of makes you look again, as you say, the, also humanitarianism and, um, you know, this this kind of remittances or charitable flows that are going in both directions, just as now, um, but also in the 19th century. Um, but I, I was also really interested in in the kind of, um, what it tells you about, about family and the way in which these missionaries became these, as you say, look, without permission, without any legal framework, without any oversight or supervision, became the foster families of these children. Um, and, you know, this, this 
what that tells you about these kinds of dispersed families, right? Or I don't know what what the modern literature calls these kind of um, care chains, you know, where people um, migrate and are looking after other people's children and leaving their children in the care of other people. And this kind of 19th century precursor of these care chains where you've got all this kind of migration um, related to, to childcare going on. So I think the book really like, you know, it sort of sparks all different kinds of questions like that through this focus on the on the Colwyn Bay School. So I, I really, I really enjoyed it, Rob. And I, yeah. I think it's for an academic book, it's very good read. So I think, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. If I'm saying it's a good read, it must be. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, thank you so, so much, Rob. It's just brilliant. And this lovely photograph that you included as well just brings it to life. Uh, photography made a big difference in, I think, helping people to connect with, with Black history and Black stories. And uh, Amazing. And there's a photograph of Ernestina there in the middle, one of the only girls who uh, who was uh, um, attended. So that's a really lovely photograph. So I'll stop sharing there and say say thank you very much indeed. It's brilliant. Robbie, so you've given a good good bit of our time, but we're going to be we're going to I'm going to ask Garrick ask his question first, and then I'll just uh, say wrap that up. Okay, Garrick. Uh, yes. Um... I haven't seen the book, but um, just listening in to the conversation, um, really, really interesting. I can just have an input into the Congolese. Um, you know, I'm a member of the Merseyside Congolese Association in Liverpool. Um, we've done a lot of work with the School of Tropical Medicine. We've had a number of lectures there. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the um, a museum and in in the International Slavery Museum, there is a wall dedicated to the Congolese uh, history and Leopold, etc. So people can actually get the narrative of, of the story. We also done um, quite a bit of work in West Kirby, um, and you you know you're referring to North Wales, so you know the connection between North Wales West Kirby. And also in Bebbington, um, you know, where the, the, the Lever brothers um, have their, their facts. So, um, you know, there's quite a bit of, of history in relation to, 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 to the Congolese uh, and their, their, their plight. Um, there is still, you know, much concern about what's going on in, 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 the, in Congo and the the, the, the divisions and the, you know the democratic and the um, the French and there there is there's a rivalry between the different uh, Congolese group um, and we found that when we try to engage with uh, with some of them that just don't want to engage with uh, other groups etc. Um, but while you were speaking about the Black history, um, um, in most recent time I've started to pull away from promoting the black history as an engagement in conversation and I started to use the British black history and put the British ahead of it and I get more engagement with audience that way um, and uh, the workshops I've been running <clears throat> during black history month um, I've been focusing on um, uh, history and looking at history from different perspective. So global history, African history, and British history. That way I can engage a much wider conversation um, and, and debate. And what I found um, over the years when I promote Black history, um, conversation, lecture, etc. Um, we get a, a different audience and, and a reduced audience. And, and for me, it's trying to engage with a much wider uh, audience and we have to try different means of doing so. 
Thanks ever so much, Garrick. That was brilliant. I was just thinking, Garrick, if you're able to join us next week, it would be really valuable to, to have you talk more about that because I think um, people relate to the local black history, but each country needs to understand its black history because British black history, for example, is so very different to US black history. So would that be all right, Garrick? Are you around next week? Can't um, hear you. Yeah, that should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know how we organise these conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> week at a time is good. <laughs> anyway. Oh, incidentally, thanks. Liz, I'm I'm committing myself falsely. Next Friday, I will be in London. Okay. Perhaps the um, week after. Then. Yes, the week after. I'll be in London for a conference. I'm speaking at a conference. Mm. Right, okay, no problem. That's brilliant, Garrick. Thank you so much. And uh, Rob, I could see you'd got your thumb up there. So thank you so much, because I really feel that, as I say, having read the beginning part of the book and dipped into other parts of the, the book, um, the beginning part really does set it into context. And I think that's what we as trying to do with Black History Conversations is to to set black history into context and look around the UK. Um, we've been fortunate enough to, um, to have Christine join us on a previous occasion and, and she'll maybe join us again and ask her what she's doing next week. <laughs> so, I do apologize, we did intend to organize the season in advance but it's not worked out like that um we got uh, very very much into windrush and uh, i'm going to use that as my next bit of the introduction anyway rob thank you very much indeed and um, please will you come back when the book is you're all right you've got a copy of the book in your hand but we want other people to see maybe if they can persuade their library to buy a copy that's probably the best way of doing it um but also the online and i will just um i'll just see if i can yeah just so folks know what it's look it looks like um when you're reading it online okay you get the two pages like it's in a book because because different ones come in different different ways and i found this reasonable i can't make it go oh here it is so you can then make it fill up your whole screen and it's and it's quite it's like reading an ordinary book. Sometimes you have to push the pages around. I suppose it depends on what machine you're watching it on. But yeah, absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure, Rob, that there's going to be a lot of interest in Colwyn Bay. I did circulate everybody, um, but we maybe need to, to do a special session, um, even a conference. Uh, uh, you know, an online conference with uh, we can bring people in like Norbert and, and others to to speak. It could be really valuable because the teachers need to know too. So thank you ever so much, Rob. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Okay. Good. Right now, Beverly. Before we've used up our time, we need to hear about about the calendar. How are you going to be able to show us these wonderful pictures? Are you going to hold them up or have you got them on the PowerPoint? Well, I've got a PowerPoint, so I could show you that as well. I mightn't be able to access it. The machine's not behaving as well as I would like, but I will try. But I just want to say thank you very much to Rob and to Christine and to Garrick. It's been extremely helpful and there's loads and loads of links, which I will start by making clear. So thank you to you all. So do you want me to do a... Try um, and share screen, Liz. Um, Simon, can you make sure that Beverly can share her screen, please? Yeah, it's set up. Okay, it may not work, but before I do that, I just want to say what prompted the, the lovely connections there are. So, looking at um, you know, what you said about the missionaries. Now, my work in has been, you know, I did a history degree decades ago, but my work currently is on African lives in Northern England making it very clear that uh, we don't see African lives as being totally separate from any other lives. There's lots and lots of links, but that you have to start somewhere and that this was a gap which we wanted to fill. And we'd hope, I mean, it's a, it will, um, other people will come on board and do their own bits and that eventually we will have lives in Northern England. 
and the multiplicity and the diversity of lives being taken for granted rather than needing promoting. Um, so it's I've very much got a Northern England and possibly even a Tyne and Ware plus Cumbria um, link. So one of the things that came to me when you were speaking was about the missionaries. And of course, in terms of the um, research we've been doing, we've got Arthur Walter, the great footballer, who came to England as a missionary to study that, to do that, to become that, and got diverted by his athletic career into being a footballer and a runner, et cetera. So it's just kind of interesting seeing the links. And then um, Celestine Edwards, who won also wanted to be, toyed with the idea of being a missionary, and then I don't think he was accepted. And then eventually was actually very, very critical of the missionaries and the way they were behaving in Africa. So it's, you know, that kind of link is lovely. Um, another link is about, you know, just students generally. And Newcastle, of course, was a, a really great place for students to come from Africa, largely because of the link between Fourier Bay College in Sierra Leone and Durham University. So we got a lot of students from British West Africa, particularly in Newcastle and student houses, et cetera. So there's loads and loads of links. And that's, you know, what is, is so lovely about these conversations. So if I go, see if I can do a share screen. If I can't, I just make it up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what I, I think the idea of calendar, while you're doing it, I think the idea of Black History Calendars is a really, really good idea. I first saw um, an American Black History calendar in um, in when I was in Jamaica. They were selling them in the right. university bookshop, and uh, it was it really opened my eyes to how very different Black American history is to uh, the the Black history that we were working on in the UK. And it was a a very valuable document. I kept it there. Right. right, how are you doing then? Um, you not so well you? yet. Um, I can't find this is in Dropbox. I, I tell you what, I'd do if I were you, I'd stop trying to share screen for a minute, I'd look on your ordinary computer and make sure that it's there looking at you in the face. Right, good point, good point. I could see you use this and start sharing again. Right, uh, recent file. really good right i'll do it that way i think you're very wise um oh, no, 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 let's wait and see if it works first <laughs> well i had a colleague as well recently who um uh, was visiting ghana and she did a, a wonderful um little film on just on a camera uh she went to um uh, elmina it was a very moving uh a um, little bit of filming and I've asked her if she'd be interested because we sometimes have our colleague from Black History Conversations, Marcia Dunkley, uh, sorry, from Black Heritage Walks. And she's, that's a different way again of telling the story of Black history. And one of the things in Colwyn Bay is that the local historical society have got a sort of Reverend William Hughes and the students from the African Institute walk. So you could actually walk around and look at the different places. But what was a tragedy there was that the chapel that was Reverend William Hughes's chapel was on sale within six months of us starting the project. And I did make a big effort to see if it wasn't possible that the town could buy it as a, a museum because many of the chapels have closed and there's an awful lot of uh, resources that aren't you know, I don't know what happens to them, the archive of materials. But we did manage to go in while it was still a chapel. And then I was over in Australia for six months. And then by the time I got back, it had been sold as a carpet well, warehouse or something. So it's distressing. <laughs> How are you doing, Beverly? Are you doing just going okay. to tell us Yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to get back to Zoom now. Just a minute. Excellent and wonderful. It's a little blue button right. on the bottom. Now it may work, it may not. Let's see. Yes, it has. No, 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 yes, here it is. Yes, Beverly Prevath has started. Ah, oh, wonderful. Right. Well done, Beverly. I don't right know off. what you can see yet. Um, 
Can you see the calendar? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Can you make, make, make it bigger? No, I can't make it bigger. Uh, Get rid of the comments. Cross the comments out on the right hand side. But it. Yeah. And if you want to make ah, it bigger. That's a bit bigger. Yeah, that's as big as it will get, I think. So mm -hmm. can people see it? Yep. Well, right. I can. right. So this so this is the calendar for 2023. And I've just got a few slides, not many to show you, but in this one, what I've tried to do is to identify it's a progression. So this is the first calendar we did in 2021. And that just came about because this was during um, was it 2021. Yes, we did it in August 20. We did it in August 2020. And this was during Zoom. I met um during lockdown, COVID. I met somebody at a conference over Zoom. She wanted to come up, she was coming up to Newcastle and she wanted to talk about her family had experienced a lot of racism and was it still there? So we met in the park over a cup of coffee and um, she said, I've got this idea of a calendar and it just took off from there. So in Zoom, I got a, a few people I, I knew from history, from community, from the museums, et cetera, to get together. And we did this calendar, African Lives in Northern England, um, which was sold out. And then from then, we then did um, school resources with Historic England. So I've put the details of the website there because it's, I mean, they did a great job of putting it online and it's for school children of the age of eight and up and it's online and they have hard copies as well, which are available. And they, as I said, it's based on the calendar, but the technical work they did was marvelous. So that was the, the next thing. And then we did a booklet on African lives in Northern England, which is there, which had a lot more detail than we can put in the calendar. And we also included um, current people. One of the issues with the calendar, we felt it might be invidious who to include and who to exclude from people who were still alive. So for the calendars, we stuck to historical. <laughs> while, for the, while for the booklet, we had a little bit more leeway and we went and we did some people who were still alive and there has been no pushback so far about that. We were quite careful um, in, in the way we did it. So, and then at the, at the bottom is our current calendar. So this is um, the kind of people we did, we included. You recognize some of them, for example, possibly you recognize Olu Shoga, uh, maybe Celestine Edwards, the very mm -hmm. famous picture by Turner on the, you know, which is linked into the Zong ship. So we did Olado Equiano, um, Chiong Murera, our MP. Um, I can't remember her name now, it slipped from Cumbria. She was an actress, the first um, person to appear, black woman to appear on television. So we've got a, ra a range, a huge range of people that was in, in the booklet. And then I thought it was perhaps kind of important to think, why were we doing it? What was the purpose of it? And it's been, you know, we've spoken at loads of conferences, etc. A few nationally, mostly in the Northeast. And for us, I think it was something about the truth, that it wasn't about prioritizing one group over another. It was how could you get nearer, not actually at this truth, but how you were approaching nearer to what was as accurate as you could be. So it was about that saying, you know, there's been myths, there's been things hidden for many different reasons, et cetera, things lost in time. Let's get back to as far as we could. So it was about the truth. And I think that's why that's on top. It was also about recognition for the African descendants in the Northeast to give us a sense of place and of belonging. That was important, but it was also to replace, it wasn't just for Africans or African descendants. It was for everybody. And the important thing for us was to kind of replace the notion of Africans as people who were enslaved only, who were victims, um, who were guests, you know, the host and guest mentality, um, with people who were residents, creators, builders. And that's kind of important because the Northeast is very proud of its history of abolition and of, um, being left-wing and being radical. And it's kind of very easy to get stuck into 
enslavement and abolitionists. I mean, the one walk we've had previously is on slavery and abolition. It kind of looms quite high in people's minds. And this calendar was trying to, the whole progress was trying to open up the story to make it a much, a much wider and connected story. So I'm just going to show very few pages of the calendar just to give you an idea of what we focused on. Um, we thought it was important to talk about the long roots of Africans in the Northeast. So we looked at Emperor Severus, um, as well, uh, African emperor, and we also looked at the first recorded African community, which is in Cumbria. And in fact, we go in there on December the 2nd to consecrate a stone there with one of the bishops and with a local school. So we thought, you know, this fact that we were there, it's not like we are here because you were there. We are here and we have been here a very, very long time. So that was, we felt quite important to, to identify. And we had, a, we had a lovely time. This would be the third trip we've been. We've been very much welcomed. And when I was talking to one of the people, of the um, one of the villagers, I said, well, your family has been here a long time. And she said, you know, your DNA may be here longer than mine. And it was a wonderful feeling, that kind of welcome, which we've always had in from this community. And it comes back to, I think, what Garrick was saying about how, you know, it's not about separation. It is actually about truth and coming together to work out as close as we can to that truth. One of the things we found was quite difficult was that, oops, there was very few, it was very difficult to find stuff about women. In the same way, working class people and women, you know, you could find the great and the good, but very rarely were women included in the great and the good. So by the booklet and then by the second calendar, we were focused, perhaps we were able to focus a bit more on women. So while in the first calendar, our two doctors were male, in our second calendar, our two doctors were female. We only have about two people on each page. And we also had nurses in the second calendar. Um, so we have a nurse here from Sierra Leone, Wellesley Cole, a doctor from Sierra Leone, was really important in bringing more and more Sierra Leone people into the Northeast. And we also have a nurse here from Trinidad. Um, um, so we were very keen to kind of get that link of the range of African descendants right through the calendar and the booklet. And of course, that it, you know, people were like Chion Wura, her mother was um, English from Wall's End, her father was from Ghana. Um, you know, we've got, oh, so many people, Ishmael Cummings, Ivor Cummings, who was what kind of key to where the people from the Windrush settled who came. He of course was from the Northeast. Um, his father was Ishmael Cummings from Sierra Leone. His mother was from around the Sunderland area, I think South Shields area. So kind of always sit, talking about our rich, complicated histories. And but it was lovely getting this picture of this nurse from Trinidad. And again, in looking at this kind of, we couldn't forget Frederick Douglass, very important to the Northeast because his freedom was bought by a couple of Quaker women. But we also wanted again to kind of ensure women were center stage. And we had Ida B. Wells, you know, wonderful, wonderful story. I mean, she did so much in the States, but she also did so much in um, in England, for example, in Liverpool. She was able to, to kind of make people aware of the cost of the cotton. That was the wealth of Liverpool, but at who was actually being, working themselves to death for their cotton. You know, she had a first um, anti-lynching society in England with the um, Archbishop of Canterbury. So really, Although it's a Northeast calendar, the stories are not just Northeast. They are the whole of Britain and, in a sense, the whole of the world. And I'm coming to the very last one, because I don't want to bore you with this. Um, what we wanted to do was, as well as having sort of the working people, like the nurses and doctors, we've also got um, entertainers. We've got, um, what's his name, Jimi Hendrix who busked around the Northeast, et cetera. We've got, of course, Paul Ropes. And, you know, there's just so much here. Sportsmen, we've got a Jamaican. Um, but we wanted community activists as well. We wanted to be sure that 
it was understood that people didn't have to be the great and the good to be valued, that just to be a person was of value. So we had um, this bit on the community activists. We had, um, um, what's his name, Minto from North Shields, uh, her, who, I mean, he, he got an MBE. The, the hostel he set up for seamen was opened by Harold Macmillan. It only lasted six years. And it's just interesting to think how hard Black-led community organizations have it, how hard it is for them to exist, and the wonderful job he did at bringing the different African groups who weren't, didn't see themselves as nations yet, you know, the, the Creole and the Igbo and the Yoruba and the Mende, and getting them together with the Trinidadians and the Jamaicans and the Bajans, and having all these people in one organization using one hostel. And, you know, to have done that was a tremendous achievement. Um, so that was Mintu in North Shields, and then more recently, the Yabantus in um, Newcastle. Again, working with the community and for the community. So in a sense, the, the calendar, the 2023 calendar, well, it has maybe 12 months, 24, maybe no more than 30 people. But we've tried to get a selection that says, we are here, we have contributed, and we are part. Not separate, we are part. And always at the end and throughout, we say, we want everybody to feel they, they can come along and do their own calendars. This is the last one we're going to do. It's a small voluntary group. We're exhausted. Um, other people, come on now, you do your own calendar um, and I've just got the address where you can get it I'll put it in I don't know if I can do bold possibly not um, but if you just email um, caroline at s4a.org.uk the calendar is available but I just wanted to say in a sense part of the context in a sense it's it's how this whole project of African lives in Northern England have become part of the Northeast. It's become part of the thinking, not just in kind of being asked to speak, not only in Black History Month, fortunately, but in, um, for example, we've been working with Tyne and Way Arts and, Arts and Museums, Archives and Museums, and we've had two projects with them. And they've all sprung out of the calendar and the this and the that. Uh, one project is um, stories of service. When we've looked at the people who worked, who worked and contributed to the effort for World War II in many ways, not just in fighting or in um, being a sailor, but in working with the community, etc. And that was, it's been very popular. It's been extended from September to October. It's now going on till January. It's an exhibition at Tyne Way Archives and Museum. And it's really kind of, I think, been an eye opener for the people coming, but also for the staff. Um, we also had, we did um, We Are Here Inspirational Women. We did something on about 16 women in the Northeast, current as well as past, and put that into the museum uh, as a permanent exhibition, slotted into We Are Here Scientists, We Are Here Educators. We are here this, we are here that. And that, I think, has, in a sense, um, woken up the museum a little bit to, to the challenges because we, it was very easy. No, it wasn't easy. It was difficult. It was a challenge for the museum to recognize that racism had existed in the stories of enslavement, etc. It was much greater challenge for them to recognize that the current people in inspirational women had also experienced racism and that they had experienced racism from the organizations that had been, that, that were the partners and funders of the museum, the universities, et cetera. So that was actually quite difficult for the museum to find a way of accepting and conveying publicly. So in a sense, it's, what I suppose I want to emphasize is that these calendars and these works don't stand on their own. They are part of a process. Uh, and we are, I think, a small part of the process, which hopefully other people will continue and contribute to. Does that make sense? 
And so please, please, please buy the calendar, send it out into your networks. Liz has the flyer. We want it to be sold out by middle of January. Thank you. And I think I will stop screen share now so we can talk. All right, that's really lovely. Now I've managed to, um, to put in the chat um, the information that you sent me um, in the email. So that says how you can pay. And, but yeah. it's caroline at s4a.org.uk. That, that's uh, it. Thank you. It's success for all more. It's a, a small education chat. I'm posting out of the, the chat, then you've got that in there. Okay. Um, Garrick, put your hand up. Yes, um, Beverly, a really, really very informative um, presentation of the calendar. Um, I was looking closely to see the price, but I see everything else except a price. Um, how much is the calendar? It's six pounds, right? And it's two fifty additional postage for up to two copies. Right. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So we, we got it um, as cheap as we could. Yeah. Excellent. And. Um, Liz, I was thinking that maybe this calendar should go to Sugar Media um, so that we can have it as a as a, a resource on the Black History um, web. Yes, yes, we could, couldn't we? Because um, then it could be purchased sort of national, international, you know, you know, we need to get it out there um, mm -hmm. to as widely uh, as, as possible. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned, which is really important. Um, and it probably relate back to what Rob um, was speaking about earlier. Um, you know, we need to move away from this narrative of, of African history starting with slavery. And I see you try to, you know, to pull that conversation in a different direction. And the approach is always that, you know, um, Africa, had their structure, their kings and queens long before European actually came into the country. So, mm -hmm. you know, let, let's pull away from that narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're gonna educate um, individuals, school children, as well as, uh, as, as, as teachers, um, you know, uh, the, the fact that, you know, people achieve certain things in different fields, you know, mm. they were prominent in this area of study, in this area of medicine, in this area, et cetera. Uh, those are the conversation that, that should be, sh we should be pushing, uh, mm. not so much the, the other stuff. And, and I think you, in your calendar, you, you, you try to address that. I think that's really a good thing. And I think that is something that all of us should try and do. Um, let's steer the conversation in a different direction uh, about you know contributions and achievements rather than you know the 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 the, the oak of the European onto the African. Brilliant! I couldn't agree more, uh, Roland um, Garrett. But just to say that this now is uh, is live. It's the Windrush Allies Network dot org um, website um, and. Uh, Maybe there's a few little things that we need to uh, to brush up, but generally speaking, it's it's got a whole lot of good information. Contact people, um, and um, and the different activities that are going on. So I think you've got a meeting, uh, Windrush Allies meeting, on Zoom at uh, this this Saturday. Or was it last Saturday? Last Saturday, I think that was. It so was this, last Saturday because I, I sent my apology, didn't I? Yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. Right, okay then. So there's a lot of information there. So um, hopefully people will find that useful. And what we just needed was uh, we needed to have a calendar to promote. So I think we can manage to promote, <laughs> to promote that heavily. So yeah. you sent me a flyer, so I'll make sure that I do that. Okay yeah. then. Well, thank you very, yeah, very much indeed. One one of our guests, Billy Billy, uh, one of our other guests who's here today is um, Makapi Selassie. So we're just going to quickly say a couple of other things. Um, I'm here in Australia, as I've been telling you, and um, there's uh, been.
couple of years ago, the podcast came up out, Stuff the British Stole. Well, Stuff the British Stole is now a TV series. So um, that's fascinating. And uh, so I, I watched the first one I had to miss last this week's, but I'll catch up on iView. Um, the first one was a problematic history of the Kohinoor diamond and how, you know, that, what that was all about. But it's so refreshing to hear, hear things spoken from another perspective. Um, so that's really interesting. But this is the one I wanted to say uh, is that McCarpy, and if McCarpy, you're able to be with us next week, then maybe you may share this um, uh work that you've done on the left behind us why the jamaican um about the jamaican windrush children and we thank you very much for doing that so that that's excellent so thank you um talked about local history um and this is uh, um a thing that you've got on the tv in the uk or on how you catch up with things over there lenny henry's um uh 90 minute one off drama um going through some of the 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 issues particularly that uh that children of the windrush generations may have experienced now what's interesting when you were talking beverly is that when garrick we do the session on on different ways of, of sharing black history stories. Um, the, the local regional thing really comes up. And what you made me recognize, Beverly, was that we need to include the uh, community activists and famous black people from the local community. So when the local community is looking at its um, different things, that different, ways of looking at black history they include that as well so i thank you very much indeed for that because that uh, that seemed to sort of wake me up on a, on a point there now looking at a totally different thing henry louis gates is the most fantastic um uh sto storyteller telling the story of american um african-american history and uh Although it says this isn't up to date, it's a fantastic series and video. And the last time I was flying, those were the days when I used to have hours and hours on planes from the UK to Australia, then um, Emirates I used to fly on and Emirates used to show his series. That's where I first came across him with his Black History series, so just amazing. Anyway, those are a few extra bits that I added in. All right, anybody else for anything else then? Thank you, McCarpy. that was brilliant that you've done that and I hope you can join us next week. Yes, Liz, I'll try my very best. Uh, greetings, yeah. everyone, and um, over and out. Well, I think, McCarpy, you better just explain where you are and who you are. I didn't really give you a chance to do that earlier. Okay, my name is Makapi Selassie. I'm in Tanzania. I born and grew up in Birmingham, England, as you most probably can tell by my accent. And um, yeah, I'm a COVID refugee and I've been uh, tuning into the Black History conversations for a while. And uh, Jawili now present next, next week or next strong on the left behind us. Okay, that would be brilliant. Okay. And I was interesting, Rob, but Rob, when you were talking about the Ethiopian movement. Um, um, quite um Macarpi's Rasta. And so when you talk about Ethiopia, Rastas relate to that. But it was really interesting what you were talking about, the Ethiopianist movements. And then you clarified that it was about um, Africans reclaiming Christianity as theirs. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, thanks. For, it's just a it's sort of reinterpretation of some parts of the Bible, which um, uh, Africans that around the turn of the 20th century are sort of saying, well, this gives us a different message here. This is about not just simply receiving 
uh, the missionary's word, but actually coming up with our own words, using our own language, our own culture, our own dress and so on, not feeling that we have to convert all of those things to be good Christians. So I think that's what Ethiopianism means at that time, at least back in 120 years ago. Since I'm on the airwaves, can I just also say thanks so much for today? It's been really great. And I really enjoyed uh, Beverly's presentation. I just, I have too many questions. That's my problem. I just want to talk about Celestine Edwards, who I'm slightly obsessed with. But I thought more generally, um, the way in which you're telling the stories of the people who kind of passed through the Northeast as alongside the stories of the people who lived there and have, were born there and resident there, that mixture is so important, isn't it? You know, um, all of them so Im important and, and, and impacting in different ways. Anyway, I could go on for ages, but I'm going to zip it. Oh, thank you. We'd love you to go on for ages. That's why we're going to invite you back again. Now, June Elizabeth is just sharing um, some interesting perspectives. Um, and you'd like to make a point, June Elizabeth? Thank you very much. Has Mugabe gone? <laughs> no, 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 Mugabe's there. Oh, oh yeah. No, uh, hello, McCarvey. Hello, everyone. And thank right, you very yeah. much, Rob, for your presentation. And Beverly and um, Rob and everybody that's on the platform, of course, Liz. I am just trying to get something to the home office that needs to be scanned. But I just wanted to say that my husband, who I did mention, belonged to the first Rastafarian movement in the UK, right? He's just sorting out his archive. Remember I said he had an archive? So I've just taken, he's got quite a lot of things. So when we get to that point where we're going to do, Mugabe and myself are going to talk about Rastafari, right? Um, Definitely, we need to do it before Christmas. Yes, I've, I've, I don't know how old this is. I'm trying to look what year it was printed, right? This Axum book about Ethiopia, right um it's a magazine and then also when they used to advertise for you to go on holiday they used to use this magazine 13 months in sunshine okay and this was printed i'm trying to see when it was printed what year was it printed in the 60s yeah like 60s to yeah. Me. yeah and then also okay this my husband has got quite a few of these Ethiopian news <laughs> and this is 1965 but it's got a few of them and finally ancient sites of northern Ethiopia so we've got quite a good archive here that I look forward to sharing with with you all when we get to that stage of um presenting Okay, it's just that he's in the library with me at the moment, and I'm in his way because I had to come upstairs to use the computer. So I thought I'd just pull a few bits out and show you. Do you remember me mentioning it? Yes, I do very much indeed. And I think okay. um, it sort of nudged me as well because McCarthy and I spoke about the idea of getting some heritage lottery funding because um, thank you. That there was a there was an there was a time when Rastafari really developed in the West Midlands and we did a project, McCarthy and myself and our very good colleague, Captain Wald, who's sad to pass now. Um, we, um, we did a project um, about the roots and development of Rastafari in the West Midlands. Now that was in the days when websites were new inventions. So we really need to go back to that. Um, but also the wider story of Rastafari in across the across Britain, because again, it's a different story to Rasta, Rastafari in uh, in Jamaica. Derek. Yes, and I have got a uh, you know the book that says um, Black British history that you can get on Amazon. What the University of Northampton had sponsored with um, the um, Black Northamptonshire Black History Association. Um, I ha I was one of the editors as well as an author. My 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 um, part of the book was about Bob Marley encounters with Bob Marley and Rast and, and Rastafari and reggae music, right? Because I knew Bob Marley, but. The, the, what I wanted to say Another that I knew Bob Marley. Pardon? Another one on you, Bob Barley. Excellent. We'll have you yeah, on. I, I, I was one of his VIP at his last concert at the Rainbow Theatre. I'm not going to talk about that because that's in the book. 
you know the book, what I've got, on Black History, what you can get on Amazon, that's my chapter. What I wanted to mention here um, was that I, as a, one of the editors, one of the editors, she's got a Polish name, but she's a Jamaican that married a P Polish man whose father was a, a Rastafarian in Jamaica. So she wrote about Rastafari in Jamaica, and it's in the book, yeah? And I had to edit that to put in the book. So it's quite an interesting book as well. So that will be um, looked at another time. But I just wanted to get it in that we've got somebody who's that real Rastaman, and she wrote about it. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. That's lots of good information, Garrick. And then we're going to wrap this up because we've taken lots of. Yeah. Robert um. This is this is quite interesting because um. What Rob mentioned around you know the definition of Christianity and 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 so forth from the the African perspective, we we could spend many many weeks and months on this subject, and if we just take you know, Jewish history and take, you know, um, just focus on that. Uh, we see the connection between Jewish history and lower and upper Egypt and referring to the land of Ethiopia, et cetera. So we could, we could spend a lot of time on that. And one of the reasons why uh, many Rasta don't accept Christianity is that it doesn't really give them the truth, the truth from, from, from the historic perspective. If you just take Jewish history alone, but if you move up further into Christianity, then you would know then that where the disciples, where they came from and where they where they went, you then make the connection, you know, with the land of Ethiopia. So we could spend many, many, you know, sessions on, on that subject matter. The most important thing is about, you know, individual really um, searching and finding information and finding information for themselves rather than individual telling them this is what you ought to to believe and accept etc but that searching is a, is the best way of discovery absolutely absolutely well well done thank you for your contribution there garrick beverly next and then anna marie if you wanted to make any comment because i didn't come back to you after robert finished his presentation. I, I'm just going to be very quick and put um, a, pl a plug in for something on that um, the African Christianity perspective. And you were saying that there was an author that you, you know you and Rob knew who had done a book on it recently. So I think it would be lovely to be able to kind of have a conversation about that at some would stage. The person that I would turn to, to I would have turned to to do that would have been Hapti Wold. He was really very really knowledgeable. McCarpy, I don't know how um, how confident you would be to talk about that, or if you know of anyone else. My husband's just mentioning. Not that yeah, confident. My husband's eighty-four years old. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you remember, my husband's eighty-four years old. And he's more articulate than myself. He edits my work. He's just reminding me that Ethiopia was, uh, you know, the was first Christian nation. First Christian nation. Mm -hmm. All right, brilliant then, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Okay then, folks. Right, well, Bob's Rob's gone off now. Perhaps. Uh, needs to do other things. Okay, we're just going to wrap up and say a very, very big thank you to you. So thank you to all of you for contributing. Rob Burrows, thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to reading, well, I look forward to reading the rest of the book. Everybody else looks forward to reading the whole book. Um, and Beverly, we look forward to uh, uh, seeing your calendar and enjoying, maybe we ought to, uh, we ought to do one, one page a month if somebody buys the calendar. <laughs> It's hard to get to, to get over here. Anyway, that's lovely. Thanks please. very much. Simon, please. if you wouldn't mind, please just wrap up the recording and then we can carry on talking afterwards. Thank you.